We've been uh, working through Paul's prayers, and in the process, we came to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and this isn't directly connected with prayer itself, as far as a commandment to pray or an example of one of Paul's prayers, but we've been talking about the fact that the Word of God in us is that edification process, that maturing process, is, is part of that rejoicing, uh, like Paul tells us in almost all his epistles, and he tells us to uh, pray without ceasing. And that praying without ceasing, that is possible when you have the Word of God in your thinking. And we, we talked about the term godliness. Godliness is having God in your thinking. And God designed us as His creatures to be like Him. It created in, we're created in the image of God. That means that we have a spiritual nature as well as a soul and a body. Animals have a soul and a body, but they don't have a spiritual nature. So what makes us like God is the fact that we have a spiritual nature like God has a spiritual nature. Uh, God is spirit, the Godhead. And so understanding how God, the moment we trust the gospel, makes us one with Christ, allows us to appreciate that God the Holy Spirit, when we trust the gospel, uh, according to Ephesians 1.13, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So we talk about the book of Acts being the Acts of the Apostles. Another name for it could be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. All the way through the book of Acts, God the Holy Spirit from chapter 2 is given and is a part of the life of the believers. We have access to spiritual blessings that God promised to Israel, not their physical promises, but their spiritual blessings in that they're made righteous in Christ. That was uh, God's redemptive purpose for the nation of Israel. We heard in Sunday school that out here, in the, uh, after the catching away the, the church, the body of Christ, at the rapture, that God is going to fulfill the prophetic program, and with the coming in of the, or the ushering in of the new covenant, that millennial reign of Christ, all the believers are going to, are going to be made righteous. They're going to be that righteous nation that God created Israel to be as an example to the Gentiles. And it's going to be accomplished under the, because the blood of the new covenant was, was offered at Calvary. And it's through the Lord Jesus Christ that all believers are made righteous. And, and Paul writes about, we read the verse this morning, those that were in Christ before me. Well, the, at the conclusion, with, after the, the, uh, the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, God was able, God in the furtherance of the program, Israel's program, the first part of the book of Acts, he, uh, he baptizes the nation, that little flock of believers with the Holy Spirit. And John's baptism, John said, I baptize you with water. There's one coming might after me who's mightier than I that's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And the tribulation period is the baptism of fire that Israel hasn't gone through yet, but they did at Pentecost. They received that Holy Spirit, and, and we've looked at that uh, quite a bit recently. So as we look at prayer, the issue with prayer has to do with God renewing our minds, us being saved. Uh, according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, God will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Coming unto the knowledge of the truth is the part that most believers today uh, are lacking in the understanding, the uh, edification process that's only possible by rightly dividing the word of truth, according to 2 Timothy 2.15. So, rightly dividing the word of truth is recognizing that the church today, the body of Christ, we talked about this quite a bit in Sunday school, but the church, the body of Christ, uh, our apostle is the apostle Paul. And according to the revelation given through the apostle Paul, believers are established today. A good verse to, uh, to refresh our memory about this truth is in verse uh, in chapter 16 of Romans, verse 25 and 26, it says, Now to him that is of power to establish you, according to what Paul calls here, my gospel. The, only Paul, you know, if you make note, what's the difference between the four gospels? 
and the ministry of the Apostle Paul, the gospel he preached. Only the Apostle Paul preached that when Christ was crucified, that's good news for the world. That's good news that Christ was crucified. When the twelve preached the cross, they preached about it. Uh, Peter in, in Acts chapter 2 preached about the cross. It was a murder indictment against Israel. He was shaming Israel for, for crucifying their Messiah. And so, but Paul is sent to preach the message that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So that's one big distinction. The kingdom gospel was the good news about Christ as Israel's Messiah. The Lord asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they say, some say you're this uh, prophet and some say you're this other prophet. And he said, whom do you say that I am? And they said, and Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. The profession of faith for believers in, uh, in time past in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was believing that God uh, had sent his son into the world, uh, that he is the Christ the Messiah that was promised, salvation was promised for Israel to uh, deliver Israel from their enemies. Why did Israel have problems with their enemies? Because they were under the law program that God gave through Moses. And Israel could not live under the law. They ended up suffering under the curses of the law until Christ, Christ was promised by even Moses in time past that God would deliver Israel when they were carried out of the land and in, a, in captivity by their enemies, that if they humbled themselves and, and confessed in their hearts their sins toward God as a nation and realized that they deserved all the curses and all the, the, uh, the captivity and, and being carried out of the land that God promised to their father Abraham, they deserved that because they failed to uh, worship the God as Jehovah and they worship idols rather than God, the gods of the Gentiles. And so when they acknowledge that, that God, would, uh, that God would give them a heart that's able to love them with all their heart, mind, and soul. That was the promise, even under the, when God gave the law through Moses, that was, that was part of Israel's revelation through Moses, that they would fail under the law, be carried into captivity. But when they were in that position, that happened with Nebuchadnezzar uh, late in the Old Testament. They were carried into captivity to Babylon, the last of the twelve tribes was. And, um, but that was, there was a, uh, there was a calendar. Uh, of events that were to take place according to Daniel 9 from the time Israel was carried into captivity uh, back here on the chart it would be right about here uh, they were carried into captivity but they were told that there would be 490 uh, years that would take place before their Messiah would be revealed to the nation he would be cut off and that uh, in the 69th week there are 70 weeks of years in the 490 year period uh, in the seven, in 69th week that their Messiah would show up and he'd be cut off, and he was, and the 70th week would be that baptism of fire when Israel would go through that last curse under the law, that, that time when God judges the nation of Israel and the rest of the nations and returns at the end of that seven year period on the white horse according to Revelation 19 to set up his kingdom and then you have the thousand year reign of Christ. So Israel's uh, prophetic program brought them to the place of the cross and there were just seven years left before the Lord set up his kingdom on the earth. We know that didn't happen. So God raised up Paul. We're given a revelation through Paul that we're established in and that revelation explains to us that the moment we trust the gospel, God the Holy Spirit baptizes us, identifies us with the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we've studied, uh, the understanding of being established as a believer helps us to uh, understand God's grace to us and what God has made us as believers identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. The forgiveness of sins is given to a believer the moment they trust the gospel. They become, according to Romans 6, were baptized into Christ and identified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. When Christ died on the cross, after we're identified by faith through trusting the gospel with Christ, we're, we, we were crucified together with him. 
We were buried with him. We were raised with him. That's why Galatians 2.20 says, For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And I, the life that I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So that's the issue for us as a believer. We're walking, being identified with Christ, seated at the Father's right hand in Christ, forgiven all trespasses. We are, according to uh, Colossians 2.10, we're complete in Christ. And so we, we learn that we're made righteous in Christ. We're justified in Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 21 says, for, uh, for he hath made him to be sin for us at the cross, who knew no sin, Christ didn't know sin, he was sinless, that we might be made the righteousness of God, where? In him. And that's why we say everything is about, in the scriptures, is it focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. He gets the glory. The Godhead is involved in all these things, but he is the image of God, the person uh, that's exalted. Learning and understanding this message uh, that, that is revealed in Romans through Philemon, the 13 epistles revealed through our Apostle Paul in our Bible, helps us to appreciate what God is doing today, how he saved us, what, what it means to be in Christ as a believer the moment you trust the gospel. And how God's power works in us when we access it by faith. Go, go to Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, uh, in verse 1, Paul summarizes after ch the first four chapters of the book of Romans, written to establish the Roman churches, uh, Paul summarizes justification by faith by saying, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Important to understand that, and what we just talked about, because of his cross work, because we trusted that Christ died to pay for us and redeemed us. Redeem redemption has to do with freedom by the payment of a price. We are bought with a price as believers. He shed his blood. We're washed from his sins in, our, in his own blood. We, have, we were purchased, and he, he goes on to say here, uh, verse 2, by whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So there's some practical application of understanding just being justified by faith in Christ, being identified by God's Spirit the moment we trust the gospel with Christ, being made righteous in Christ, we have peace with God. No more is God looking at us and judging us as he did under the law program and chastising Israel in this dispensation of grace. We have the privilege of when God looks upon us as believers, he sees us as in his son clothed in Christ's perfect righteousness. He sees our inner man. Now there's the sin nature that's still in our body of flesh that we'll have until the day we die that wars or has a conflict uh, with our spiritual man, the inner man. And our inner man, being in, indwelled by God the Holy Spirit, being made righteous in Christ, is, has a perfect standing before the Father. He look, God looks at us and He sees who we will be for eternity. He sees us as perfectly righteous in His Son. But He also sees that we're not enjoying the the, the quality of life as a believer that we would be if we we're walking in his righteousness and his son's righteousness. If we were allowing the word of God to transform our lives, we would have more joy and we would be able to, uh, to glorify God and the Lord Jesus Christ by walking by faith in him, in the righteousness God gave us to walk in. So Paul goes on to say that here in verse 3. What about when trouble comes in your life? If we have peace with God, it's not to chastise us or punish us, right? Why do bad things happen to good people today? Verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. When you access by faith the grace of God, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, when you're walking, accessing by faith the righteousness God's given you, and you're thankful 
For the salvation, God committeth his love toward us, and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. When you're by faith rejoicing in the salvation God's given you, and the standing he's given you in his son's perfect righteousness, when trouble comes, if you realize this trouble isn't uh, given by God to punish me, or for my undoing, or, or destruction. This trouble that's come is, is the same trouble that's upon all creation. It's the result of us living in a sin-cursed world. And sometimes the trouble comes because we make some bad decisions, don't we, as believers. And that's where God would have us help, would God would rather that we allow His Word to transform our minds in that we can walk in His wisdom and prudence, knowing some things are going to be trouble for us, we better stay away from them. And in maturity, we have the freedom as a believer today. We don't have to live under the dominion and power of sin to control us as an unbeliever does. An unbeliever with his willpower and self-discipline is not able to stop sin in their life as a believer. Okay, God has equipped us to be able to access by faith the righteousness that He's given us in Christ and live as a, a saint of the Most High God should live. We have the choice. We can put off the old nature and put on the righteous saint of God. God has made us in His Son. We can do that. We have a choice as a believer. Grace puts us on the spot. We have the choice. Now it's our decision. Are we going to walk in the perfect righteousness God's given us to walk in? Or are we going to live as a fail? Some people put a bumper sticker on their car. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And to excuse the sin in their life. And we don't make excuses for sin as, as believers. We realize that every time we sin, it's a choice that we made to allow sin to control us and do that. And we can put it off. Now, in reality, are we ever going to be perfectly sinless as believers in this life? And the, the thing is, we, we have an old nature. We get tired. We do things sometimes when we're weak and tight. And Paul explained to us that he prayed thri three times that God remem uh, remove a thorn in his flesh. He called it the messenger of Satan to buffet him. And God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So the power of God works in us when we access it by faith. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, uh, Paul says that it effectually works in us when we believe. So we can access by faith God's grace and walk in it. And as uh, we were, if you're still in Romans 5 there, he says, not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing tribulation worketh patience, and patience worketh experience, and experience works hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. How? By the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So that's the point. Be learning these truths and allow us to access them by faith and walk in them. And it's our choice to learn these truths and access them by faith and walk in them. God, is a, uh, God gives us a free will as believers. We can choose to uh, submit to God's Word and walk in the pro program that He's given us to walk in by the obedience of faith or not. We'll still go to heaven when we die, but the difference is there's reward for those who allow God's Word to live in us and through us. For Christ to, be, uh, to get glory by us acknowledging He's delivered us from the power of sin and we can walk in a, better, uh, in a way that's more pleasing to God when we walk by faith in light of who and what God has made us in His Son. So there's that freedom, there's that joy, that's the ability to pray without ceasing is putting in mind the program God's given us, recognizing deliverance from sin, redemption that we have, freedom by the payment of the price, rec realizing we're, we're purchased by God, we're, we're saints of God. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, we read, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry... As we have received mercy, we faint not. Now, read down to verse 6 with me first. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully. There are a lot of preachers that handle the Word of God deceitfully today. But by manifestation of the truth, 
commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. He's the judge who's going to judge all of us by what we do with this book that God has given to us to walk in. Um, verse 3, but if, but if our gospel, the gospel that saves the power of God unto salvation, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God, small g God, of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the, what, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. They can hear the gospel, but through unbelief they reject it. They're in darkness. And that's, uh, in the time left, we're going to try to go through some of these passages. Verse 5, For we preach our ministry, uh, in verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, verse 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Who's created in the image of God? We're created in the image of God, spirit, soul, and body, but Christ is the image of God, according to Hebrews chapter 1. He is the, the, the uh, manifestation of God to us, all people on the earth. He's been manifested in time past. He was there are pre-incarnate manifestations of the Lord Jesus Christ as Jehovah in time past, uh, as when he walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day at, uh, in the garden, as when he walked with Noah, as when he walked with Enoch, as when he walked with Abraham and appeared to Abraham in the plains of Mamre at the tent, and Abraham makes food for him, and, feed, and the Lord sits down with the two angels and eat with them but on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah and they tell share with Abraham why they're, they've come to judge Sodom and Gomorrah if, if the wickedness was what God understood it to be there and so uh, he appeared with uh, to Moses in the burning bush and on the mount he's the creator the Bible says of all things he's the creator that moved in the six days of creation um, the manifest person of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he was made flesh and dwelt among us. He took a body. He was, uh, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but uh, took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So the Lord Jesus Christ uh, it says here, verse 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, that face of Jesus Christ should sound familiar with you. Uh, and he mentions a ministry in verse 1 there. What ministry, he says, seeing we have this ministry, chapter 3, the prior chapter, he talks about this ministry. Verse 1, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Um, Paul's saying, we, you know, as Billy said in Sunday school this morning, Paul magnified his office, not himself as a person. He magnified the privilege to be the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul says here, do we begin to commend ourselves, or need we as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle, the, the doctrine living in you, the doctrine that saved you and lives in you, you're established in, that's our epistle. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, they're epistles of Christ. Now notice what he's talking about here. Ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. That's the ministry we have. God will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. The doctrine, when we trust it, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Those, that word, whenever we trust, that Christ died to pay for our sins, 
We trust in His death on the cross as the payment for our sins, our individual, our personal sins. Then God, that moment, sees our faith and positive response to the, the call of His gospel and saves us. God the Holy Spirit identifies us with Christ. We've talked about that. And then God says He would have all men to be saved, made one with Christ, in His perfect righteousness, and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Learn about what that means. What a, a lot of people think, okay, I, I'm pretty sure I won't lose my salvation because I trust that Christ died for my, my sins. But there's some understanding that you get after realizing what God's made you in Christ and how He, God the, uh, the, God the Holy Spirit, is the seal that keeps us in Christ. Why it is that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, because in Christ, all of our sins are paid for under the blood of His cross. We live sometime, someplace out here. We hope it's close to the rapture. Uh, but whenever Christ died, it was about 2,000 years ago. How many of our sins did Christ die for back here? All of them. So how many sins in our lifetime then, how many sins were paid for? All of them. Even though we got saved, a lot of us got saved when we were young. Even though when we got saved, all of our sins were forgiven. But that all of our sins, Christ died. He's not going back to the cross to pay for more sins that we commit in our lifetime. It's not just until the day we're saved and then we have to confess our sins in order to have those daily sins forgiven, like some religions teach, that puts you under a bondage, under the law, under a performance program in order to have the blessing of God and, and to keep God's blessing of salvation. Eternal life is eternal. It's not temporary life. Eternal life is the, the, the life that, and the righteousness that we have in Christ. His righteousness is eternal. When God sees us, it's dependent upon His righteousness whether or not we go to heaven when we die. And so we're saved and we come unto the knowledge of the truth. And Paul calls it here, you're uh, talking to the Corinthian saints, he says, for, for as much as ye are, verse 3, manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. That's that edification process that the Word of God is rooted, we become rooted and grounded in the truth. That's that process where the Word of God is written in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that lives in us. We're led by the Holy Spirit today as believers, but it's this truth that God the Holy Spirit is leading us with. He's leading us by the truth that God's given for our obedience, as we read this morning in Romans chapter 16, verse 25 and 26. The obedience of faith, Romans chapter 6, is what we walk in. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. That's how God the Holy Spirit works in us today because of the cross, because of the living union we're given to, with Christ the moment we trust the gospel, because it's that spiritual blessing of the new covenant that God promised to Israel, but through Paul's message and ministry, we learn that that, that dwelling of God the Holy Spirit is part of our program too. And that's how we're made righteous in Christ. That's God's redemptive purpose in all the ages. So if we read down in verse 4, And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of who? Is of God, who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, that's talking about the law in the Old Testament, but the Spirit, what? Giveth life. Notice verse 7, But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Remember he came down from the mount, his face shone, he had to put a veil over it so that they could look upon him. Verse 8, How shall not the ministration of the what? Of the Spirit be rather glorious. That's what we live under today in this, this dispensation of grace. It's the ministration of the Spirit. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of what? Righteousness exceed in glory. Because of the indwelling Holy Spirit, because of the righteousness of believers made in Christ, 
That exceeds in glory. That was what the Old Testament program was all about. The law was to a schoolmaster to lead Israel to Christ. But now we're not under a schoolmaster. We're under grace. We have God's perfect righteousness imputed to us.